Good afternoon. Welcome to this week's UT Energy Symposium. I'm David Tuttle. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in the Energy Institute. We have another great speaker today. His name is Russell Gold. He's an award-winning journalist at the Wall Street Journal, where he is the senior energy reporter. He started his journalism career at the Philadelphia Inquirer and the San Antonio Express News. In 2000, he joined the Wall Street Journal and covered Texas and economics before switching to energy in 2002. His reporting has taken him to five continents and above the Arctic Circle two times. In 2010, he was part of the Wall Street Journal team that covered the Deepwater Horizon explosion and oil spill. And the journal's work was awarded the Gerald Loeb Award for the best business story of the year. And it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in national reporting. He's, he's a great journalist. His book, The Boom, was long listed for the FT, for Tan Financial Times, Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year Prize in 2014, and now he's working on a second book that he's very secretive, somewhat secretive on. Maybe he'll tell us a little bit more about it right now or afterward. I'm also proud to say that Russell was our first energy journalist fellow at the University of Texas at Austin. And his title is, is his talk is titled Fail Faster, Be Nimbler, Does Oil and Gas Industry Have Anything to Learn? from Silicon Valley. So join me in welcoming Russell Gold. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be back at UT. I was here from uh, September 15 uh, through the end of August of this year. So I just left campus and went back full time with the Wall Street Journal. Um, and you know, I was going to tell you a little bit about the book I'm working on. I'm about five chapters in. But then I remembered that this is taped and archived on the web. And um, I, I think I'm going to keep my mouth shut about it. But it's a really, I'm very excited about it. It traces um, a single individual and tells his story uh, from about 19, uh, the late 1990s to the present as he negotiates his way through the energy world and all the various lessons about um, energy change that come with that. So let me start off with a story. Um, imagine a company that has a limited supply of capital. And they've calculated their run rate. They know about how many months uh, or years they have at the current spending rate before they run out of money. And you know, they need to innovate. They need to come up with a product um, or, or a new idea, some way to generate revenue before they run out of money uh, and, and are forced to sell off their nice IMAX and Aeron chairs and have a fire sale and go out and find new jobs. Well, this is pretty much the plot of season two of Silicon Valley on HBO, um, and also the plot of a lot of Silicon Valley startups. But it's also the story of Mitchell Energy uh, in the late uh, 1980s and 1990s. So let me back up. Mitchell Energy, as some of you may know, um, was owned by George Mitchell, who's been called the father of fracking, or the father of shale. Um, and here is part of his story, because it gets us to the creation of fracking. Um, he buys a bunch of acreage, uh, believe it or not, from a bookie um, in, in Houston. The acreage is up near Fort Worth. And he goes out and starts drilling it, drills a bunch of wells, finds a lot of natural gas, believe it or not, actually uses a very early form of fracking to get the gas to flow. But um, he's producing from what's called the Boonesville Bend conglomerate gas field. And there's a lot of gas coming from it. These are conventional gas wells. And he sells a contract to deliver a certain amount of gas, I think it was 100 million cubic feet a day, um, into an Amarillo to Chicago pipeline. Because Chicago really needed natural gas. They would pay a good price for it. Um, they wanted to keep their homes warm, their factories going. And so this was the contract. He got, he got money um, and provided the gas. And all this worked really fine from the 1950s up until the early 1980s when he realized that the Boonesville Bend was starting to run out of gas. And he still had the contract with the pipeline. And it was, a, um, it was a contract where if he could not provide the 100 million cubic feet a day from his own wells, he would have to go out into the market and buy that to provide it to the pipeline, which would have been um, a, a catastrophe for him. So he's beginning to deplete the field. He's not there yet. This is the run rate. But he can look at how many wells and how productive his wells are and realizes that he might only have 10 years left. 
of producing from this field, but he had longer than that on the pipeline contract. Um, and so, you know, he sort of realizes that he was facing potentially a financial disaster um, if he couldn't find more gas. And, you know, so that, that was his run rate. It was his depleting, uh, it wasn't depleting money as it is in Silicon Valley, it was depleting gas. It was a gas reserve. So he needed to innovate. And his solution was, beginning in the early 1980s, to encourage innovation at Mitchell Energy. And he created what's been called sort of a Bell Labs type atmosphere. Go out and drill wells, figure out a way to get more gas from these rocks than we have in the past. Um, and by the late 1990s, there's a young completion engineer from the University, a University of Texas graduate um, who's working as the completion engineer for him. And he figures out a way to use a slick water frack to open up the Barnett Shale, which was the source rock underneath the Boonesville Bend. Uh, and so suddenly, Mitchell Energy had lots of natural gas for its pipeline contract and everything else. Mitchell Energy was facing an existential crisis and was forced to innovate. It's sort of a classic business story. Um, and it was able to successfully innovate its way out of the crisis. That story is what gave us the energy boom that really begins in some ways in around the year 2000, but more uh, intently around the year 2005 uh, and continued on to 2014. So let's fast forward a few years now um, to December 2005. That's when uh, ConocoPhillips bought Burlington Resources. Burlington had lots of assets. It had um, producing fields in China and Africa. It actually had a nice stake in Alaska as well. Um, but the real sizzle in the stake, what Conoco really wanted from Burlington Resources was what was then called its unconventional natural gas. Burlington Resources was one of the first movers into shale. They were doing well in shale. They knew how to, uh, they knew how to get shale uh, make it productive. And so ConocoPhillips paid $35.6 billion for Burlington Resources. It was a staggering amount then. It's still a staggering amount today. Um, Conoco had seen the future, and it was shale. It wanted a piece of that. And just, you know, as a side note, it's kind of easy to forget this now, but ConocoPhillips back then was really one of the big three. It was Exxon, Chevron, and ConocoPhillips. Subsequently, they broke themselves up, and they're now a much smaller company. But this was a big deal. This was big oil entering the shale when that, when that happened. Um, and so uh, when it bought Burlington, so Burlington Resources had the assets, had the shale leased up, and it had the management team. Um, and so how did that deal work out, Conoco buying Burlington, $35 billion? I think it was an abject failure. Because the big bureaucratic Conoco came in and essentially stifled Burlington resources. Um, Burlington had previously been known as this fast-moving, agile company. And, and that company, which had created huge amounts of value, basically just disappeared. I mean, who knows where it went? It sort of was swallowed up somewhere inside of ConocoPhillips. The key personnel left as soon as their uh, shares vested and they could get out. Um, and, and incidentally, a lot of the top people from Burlington Resources end up going with this new phase or this new um, trend that was hitting the oil markets and went out and got private equity money and created their own companies. And so it's kind of a little side note. This was the mid-2000 to 2005. At that point, shale still kind of meant natural gas. Conoco ended up getting something of great value from that deal, but it wasn't what they wanted at all. What they wanted was to bring in, was to graft the DNA of this shale company onto, in, into the larger DNA of a big oil company. And that failed. But as it turned out, um, Burlington Resources had these legacy assets, um, this old conventional oil, down uh, in South Texas. And so Conoco ended up owning a nice chunk of the Eagleford. It's completely unintentional, and it pretty much saved Conoco's hide about five years later. Um, but the whole idea of grafting this DNA, this smaller, agile, quick-moving company onto the big oil company was a failure. Uh, and there was a lot of value that was destroyed. So, um, oh, and the shale that they sent $36 billion on, it, it didn't work out. And one of the big reasons it didn't work out is that the management skill that Burlington Resources had, that they had figured out, wasn't about the assets. Conoco thought it could buy the assets, the leases, 
in the ground, which contained shale. That wasn't what it was about. It was a management skill to figure out how to get um, the oil and gas out. And I'll get to that in a second, because it sort of gets to the heart of what I'm trying to talk about. So other companies looked at this fiasco and said, we don't want to do that. But we do want to kind of get into the shale business. So Rex Tillerson, the head of uh, ExxonMobil, then and now, back in 2009 and, and still today, he went out and he bought XTO Energy for $41 billion. He said, I'm going to do things differently. I'm not going to take sort of what was good about this company and smother it. Um, and so he kept XTO and their old historic Fort Worth headquarters that was in a converted old bank building, beautiful building, um, kept them as an independent operating unit, used retention bonuses, investing options a lot more intelligently to keep the management teams in place. So the idea was we're going to take, we're not going to try to graft them onto us, we're just going to buy them and keep them operating as an independent unit and see if they can kind of keep doing the magic that they've been doing. Well, anyone who's ever been following ExxonMobil will realize that X, the XDO purchase is sort of considered the biggest screw up of the CEO's career. Um, now, mostly that was because he bought when gas prices were very high and then they started falling and plummeting um, because gas prices have been falling for what, since then, seven years straight? Um, not falling, but have fallen and, and not going anywhere. So Big Oil was sort of working on this theory at the time. We'll buy the shale. We're big and we're smart. We got lots of good R&D. And we're going to figure out the optimal way to develop shale. And then once we figure that out, we're just going to go stamping well after well after well after well, and we're going to make a mint of money. Because we, we can figure this out, and we can drive down costs, and we can do it intelligently. And we'll sort of throw all of, all of our resources out after it. Um, and um, as it turned out, it was a good idea. It was a solid idea. And this sort of design one, build many approach had worked really well for them when it came to something like a big offshore platform. Spend lots of money to design one, and then you sort of create carbon copies everywhere. You cut the costs. Um, it works out. But it didn't work out. Um, that idea, design one, build many, was spectacularly ill-suited for shale development. Because when it comes to shale, one size does not fit all. Shale, um, shale wells are bespoke. They're Seville Row, not men's warehouse. And what Exxon and Conoco and all the other large companies that wanted to chase into shale thought is that they could sort of do a men's warehouse. We can drive down the cost and, and print out lots of, of suits. But no, every shale well, not every well is different, but they were different enough. Uh, what works in Ector County in the middle of the Permian Basin might not work two counties over in Loving County. In fact, what works on the east side of Loving County might not work on the west side of Loving County. And what I'm talking about here is designing wells, figuring out exactly how to build the wells to get the best return on. Um, that was sort of one of the key lessons of shale. And to excel in an environment like that, with a challenge like that, with rocks like that, you need to be able to decentralize your decision making. I mean, this is sort of the basic lesson that some companies figured out and some didn't. Um, you need to empower your field operations crew. So what do I mean by that? You need to be able to tell your crew on the ground, you guys are closest to the rock. You're seeing what's going on. You get to make the decisions. This is sort of the opposite of design one, build many, where all decisions are going, you know, being scrutinized and visited and revisited by, um, by lots of engineering teams. This was on the ground, you figure it out. That's what's made shale works. Um, it's sort of a, you need to be willing not just to, to, to allow for decentralized decision making, you need to embrace it. Uh, and this kind of shop floor democracy, um, if you're going to do well at shale development, should come more naturally than a hierarchical bureaucracy. This idea that the people on the ground know best. Uh, and if that's not your default mo mode of thinking, you probably shouldn't get into shale because you're going to destroy value. You're not going to be as competitive as some other companies. So Aubrey McClendon, the, the sort of the Chesapeake founder and CEO, the sultan of shale, um, he was known for his attention to detail, for really top-down 
management, but it was always in things like financial decisions and raising money and in land acquisitions. He was a landman at heart. He really didn't get involved at all in the engineering of wells and figuring out, so what do I mean by that? How much water do you put in? What's your pump rate? How much prop ends? How long do you build your laterals? Uh, how many stages? Do you do 100 foot stages, 200 foot stages, 300 foot stages? Do you use slick water? Do you use a gel, et cetera, et cetera? Do you use sand? I don't even know the sizes. This size, this size, that size. I mean, there are all sorts of different variables. He didn't get involved in that at all. In fact, he empowered and left his field marshals to do it. So I would argue to you, and this is just based on having spent time talking to people inside these companies, learning about these companies, how they operate well, how they don't operate well. And I would argue that shale done well um, is the essence of a willingness to take chances and to fail fast. And remember what I was saying about Loving County, which is this tiny little county out right south of New Mexico, uh, out by El Paso. There's like 130 people. Um, and it's got great Delaware Basin oil wells out there. So remember what I was saying about Loving County. You drill a well, um, you get the results back of what you're seeing in terms of what rocks. You stimulate it. You put it on production. You get your initial production numbers. You figure out quickly what's working and what's not working. You modify for the next well. You learn from that mistake. You do it again until you sort of perfected what works in that area. Um, and so this is sort of this fail fast model of shale development. Um, embrace the mistake. Figure out what you've done well, what you don't, haven't done well. Make a change to that. Uh, get better the next one. Shale is at its heart an iterative process. It is not a design one, build many process. Um, and so the companies, I think, that did it right sort of embraced this willingness to experiment, this willingness to embrace their mistakes, to fail fast, to learn, to move on. And so that's the first point I really want to make today. Uh, the people who developed modern fracking were willing to embrace their mistakes, to learn from their mistakes. And I would argue right now that's more akin to what you see in Silicon Valley than what you see in big oil campuses. Um, because big oil has sort of, at least the version of it that lives in, in Houston today, is very conservative and very risk averse. And is not well suited for a lot of the oil and gas development that's going on. So here's an example of the willingness to embrace and learn from mistakes. There was a guy named um, Ray Walker supervising a frack job in the Cotton Valley of East Texas in the 1990s. It was a small sandstone frack. They hadn't really started working on shale yet, high porosity. Um, and this is how he told me the story. There was a gauge measuring water volume at one of the Union Pacific Resources wells that he was working on. The gauge had broken. And before the malfunction was discovered, a young employee had pumped a lot more water than was supposed to have been pumped into this well. So the young employee runs over in a panic and says, what are we supposed to do? And Walker says, you know what? Let it flow back. See what happens. We made a mistake. Let's learn from it. And the well turned out to be a really solid producer. So Walker embraced that mistake and learned from it. And what he got from it was that the conventional wisdom, which told you you needed a very viscous gel to carry the prop in deep into the well, um, and if you didn't, the sand would fall out and collect. But in this case, they had had a much more watery well. A lot more water than they were used to, a lot less chemicals, a lot less propane, and it had worked just as well. So in fact, what they were doing was they were driving down the use of the costly items, the sand and the, the gel, and were using water, which at the time was rel relatively inexpensive. He ended up writing an engineering paper, I think for SPE, you probably can still find it, uh, which he titled Propins. We Don't Need No Propins, which was an allusion to the treasure of the Sierra Madres for anyone who's a Humphrey Bogart fan. Um, so, oh, my favorite part about the paper um, was that, uh, you know, so he sort of explains, look, we're figuring out how to do this with cheaper, you know, we're getting, much, we're getting better results from cheaper inputs, better wells, better economics. Um, and my favorite part was he concluded the paper with, quote, why it works is still generally unknown. They didn't know what was going on at the bottom of the well. They just knew it was working. They were getting a lot more gas out. Um, mistake embraced. So one of the people who read this story, excuse me, who read this paper, 
and would hear Walker and others tell stories over barbecue and golf around Fort Worth, it was a very collegial type environment, was that University of Texas engineer I told you about who worked for George Mitchell and the Barnett. So he asked for and got permission to observe one of Ray Walker's new watery fracks, and he did that out in East Texas, and he called up Walker, says, can we have a meeting? So Walker thought this young graduate, this young guy named Nick Steinsberger, um, whose son was going to UT, so I don't know if he's around today. So if he is, hello, I've never met him. Um, calls him up and says, look, I, I, I want to have a meeting. Walker thought, well, he's coming in to get a job from me. But instead, Steinsberger walks in and says, all right, here are all the maps we have of, of the Boonsville Bend and where the Barnett Shale is. I want to try one of your water-heavy fracks in the shale. Where do you think I should do it? What have you learned? And so they discussed this, and Walker thought it was a really cool idea. Um, and, uh, and they did it. Well, Walker gave him his idea. So Steinsberger goes down to the woodlands and says, please give me permission to try this new form of fracking. And as I told you before, Mitchell, who he worked for, was open to that. He needed to innovate. He saw the run rate uh, coming to an end and said, sure, you have permission, three wells. Uh, he screened out all three wells. The sand clogged up the wells. The experiment was a failure. Uh, it was a mistake, couldn't really learn from it because there was nothing really valuable there, but he was learning that not to do that again. So he went back to the woodlands. He said, three more wells, please. They said, okay, fine, three more wells, and that's it. Fourth well screened out. The fifth well was the S.H. Griffin number four, located near Ponder, Texas, and you probably can figure out by now. That was the first modern fracked well um, in the United States, uh, summer of 1998. Um, and it was because it was into shale, low porosity, it worked, it was productive, low cost, got rid of a lot of gels, slick water frack. Um, so you can see in this interest and this desire to experiment, um, innovation at play, cross-pollinating of ideas between different companies, uh, sharing ideas, moving ideas from one company to another. Um, and, and I would argue that this kind of rapid dissemination of ideas as people change companies, they talk to engineers at other companies, they combine, they recombine, you know, they get jobs in different places. Um, and, and this willingness to try out a new idea, willingness to fail, is much more characteristic these days of Silicon Valley than it is of Houston. A lot of people go to Houston, they get a job, and they stay there for 20 or 30 years. There's not that kind of cross-pollination that you see uh, in, in companies that are failing constantly, so you've got to go get in Silicon Valley, you've got to get a new job. You know, you meet this person, you, well, we tried this over here, maybe we can try it over there. That's a very different model. So, a little bit of a side note, at the same time all this idea swapping is going on in Fort Worth, we're also seeing the beginning of a period of a rapid growth in renewable energy in the United States, uh, in particular wind energy. Right? This is right at the end of the 90s, early 2000s. And um, there was, incidentally, a large company that was willing to take a lot of risks, try new things, um, and it was very involved in wind at the time. In fact, it was the large company that brought capital to a capital-starved industry uh, and really helped the wind industry survive for a period in the, we had about 95, 96, 97. Anyone want to take a guess who that company was? Enron. Um, but. You know, that, they were the exception. You know, when it came to, um, uh, when, when it came to trying new ideas, Enron loved new ideas. Now, granted, they played a little fast and loose with their financials, but that's another issue. Um, and when it came to the sort of the development and deployment of these new wind turbines that we're seeing at the time, much higher megawatt capacity, uh, much higher capacity utilization, they would go for longer. They would go longer without breaking down. Um, it wasn't the utilities that were embracing it. It wasn't the big, stodgy companies whose whole job it was to deliver electricity reliably and were regulated uh, by the states. Um, it was a crop of new small wind developers who would partner up with financial firms uh, to use the production tax credits that were available. Uh, and so sort of once again, it's sort of this interesting idea. If you want energy innovation, where does it come from? It did not come from the incumbents. It came from small developers and frankly, people like J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs who didn't have anything to do with it but liked the idea of the tax credits they were getting and were funding these wind farms. Um, anyway, so, so this, this alliance between 
entrepreneurs, some of them ideologically driven, and Wall Street financiers was a new combination. Um, and, and I would suggest that there, it really is not all that dissimilar to the relationship between venture capitalists in Silicon Valley and some small undercapitalized companies that we see out there. And so they ended up establishing the, this, this group of uh, establishing the industry, and then the big European companies arrived. And today we have 6.5% of our electricity coming from wind. Uh, if this had been left to the incumbent utilities, I would be surprised today if we were at half of that level. Uh, why? Because many of these companies were still building large nuclear plants, design one, engineer it to within an inch of perfection, uh, that were adding billions to their rate base. They were acting a lot like big oil companies building expensive offshore wells. Uh, and meanwhile, the wind energy companies were starting to run circles around them, just like the shale developers were starting to run circles around big oil. You know, pew, 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 with these small little wells instead of these big, gi ugh, big giant offshore wells that would take 10, 15 years. So, not, and by the way, I do have some slides. I will get to them in a few couple minutes. It wasn't just a head fake. Now, not everything is bad about the big oil model. Okay, so let's take a second and sort of just acknowledge what works about the big oil model uh, in terms of developing new energy technologies and getting them out the door. Um, they have tremendous access to capital markets. They can get billions of dollars. Um, they have political clout. Most of them, not all of them, but they still have fairly reasonably sized R&D budgets and R&D departments. Uh, some of you might be working for them one day. Um, they have the ability to think strategically about long-term problems, which is very important in the energy sphere. Um, so there's a question that I've been asking myself about these two models, and that is, is there any way to marry what's good about the big energy incumbents and Silicon Valley ethos? Is there some way to graft the DNA from one onto the other? I'm not sure which way you want to go, but can you sort of combine those two? So let me suggest, and maybe this is the second big point I want to get at today, that to thrive into the future, big oil companies are going to need to adopt a little bit of Silicon Valley and start thinking and acting a little bit like Silicon Valley companies do. So, I was interviewing the head of SunPower recently. SunPower is based out in the, the Bay Area, major um, solar, uh, solar company out there. They do both rooftop and utility scale development. A uh, little bit on the, the higher end in terms of cost, but you get a good product. That's sort of their business model. Um, and a couple of years ago, the majority of their shares were bought by the French oil company Total which is one of the what, five or six giant oil companies in the world today. And so the, the head of it, the CEO, was telling me of a trip that was made by Total executives to Silicon Valley recently, it's the last couple months. And they went to Google X to figure out what Google X was up to. They went to large venture capital firms. And they came away thinking about, excuse me, the future of energy. And they were trying to think about how they can speed up the metabolism of a large company. And the total executives were asking questions like, how do you manage the agility and speed of a Silicon Valley company? One that's ready to scrap a business plan in a heartbeat, pivot over to something else. Um, how do you marry that with what works about a big oil company? Access to capital, R&D, et cetera, et cetera. Glo globe straddling logistical capabilities. Um, nobody has succeeded at this. Not yet. But Total is giving it a shot. And I think it's important, and I'm paying a lot of attention to that experiment because I think it's important to try. Um, the shale companies have strands of a similar culture in their DNA. They're quick. Uh, they're nimble. They figured out that they need to move quickly in order to succeed at their business. And so, um, so why is Total doing this? Well, for one, they're a French domiciled company. Um, and they're facing significant regulations requiring them to look at their carbon emissions. This is a French law. By the end of the year, they've got to have a level of disclosure about emissions and what they're doing about it that is far and away beyond anything we're doing here in the United States. But they're also looking at the future of energy. Uh, and they're making investments not just in solar, but in batteries, and actually in utilities as well. So they're, they're trying to figure out, like, look, we produce oil 
and natural gas, and we've got this whole centralized model of getting it out of the ground and distributing it to customers, but we want to know more about this distributed model of energy production, where you're generating electricity on your roof and you're storing it in batteries, and maybe you're selling it back to the utility at the high price cost of day, or maybe you're just storing it so that when the power price goes up in California in the afternoon, you're providing your own electricity, and you're missing that peak and that peak pricing. So, they're trying to understand and diversify, or, and, and maybe one of the other things they're doing is trying to diversify away from just fossil fuel revenue. Because do we know what the price of fossil fuels are going to be in the future? They've seen the booms and busts, you know, and, and maybe solar looks more attractive to them. So there's a couple caveats. Maybe they're doing it as a recruitment tool to get younger employees who seem to like renewables. Uh, we've also seen BP and Shell do this before. They both jumped with both feet into wind about 10 years ago, and then they abandoned it. Uh, but it bears watching. And it's important, and this is more than just an exercise in business school case studies, uh, because I, I genuinely believe, and I think there's plenty of evidence out there, uh, that the energy world's about to start changing very quickly. Uh, and, and in fact, it's already begun, a great upheaval. So, Let's take a look at the slides and just, I just want to go through some examples that I, are on my mind about changes and change agents right now. Um, United States electricity fuel mix, 14 year period. Take a look at what happened to coal. Completely eviscerated its market share. Went from 50% to 33% and falling quickly. Natural gas pretty much doubled its market share. Uh, wind and solar, you can't even see them in 2001. Uh, they've now grabbed 5 and 1%. So I should, when I said 6.5% earlier, I'm sorry, that was wind and solar combined. Uh, apologize. Um, so this is a, a very fast changing generation mix. Um, now, that's not going anywhere either. The top map takes a look at planned utility scale generation additions. Green is wind. Yellow solar, a lot of that coming on, a lot of natural gas, which is sort of reddish. I'm a little colorblind. Um, the only other dot I can see is what happened in Washington State, where they're putting in a new hydro plant, it looks like. All of the, so once again, oh, and what's being retired? This is down here, planned retirements. Nuclear is being retired. Coal is being retired. That change is only accelerated. At least that's what the government tells us. Cost of solar panels. This is a slide from um, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, I think. A um, couple things to note here. This is not, these are actual what are PPAs, power purchase agreements. This is actual deals between people buying and selling power. This is not some notional idea of what it might cost to put a solar panel up on your roof. This is what large utility scale solar installations are charging for electricity, what kind of deal they're making. Um, and uh, the clear trend, obviously, is towards lower pricing from 2006 down to 2015. That you can see. Um, the weighted price is now below $50 a megawatt hour. Uh, it's not a parity, but it's closing in. The declining relevance of OPEC is another big factor happening right now. Uh, so this is, this is a graph that I put together, just takes a look at what the IEA, the International Energy Agency, says supply, global supply and demand for oil are. We are now in our 11th straight quarter where supplies exceeded demand. If you want to have an idea of why prices are where they are, that's pretty much it. Um, it is a market that's not in balance. And I would argue, is this a market with anything even remotely close to a functional oil price setting cartel? And the answer is no. Um, I sort of got into this, I did a talk at Energy Week last week where I made the argument that Saudi Arabia is actually acting very rationally by abandoning the cartel approach and by grabbing market share. Uh, and my argument, which I still very much stand behind, uh, was that, um, or, or still is that, uh, what they're doing is they're looking ahead and realizing that they don't have, in the 1980s they cut market share, they cut prices. They gave up market share in order to bring prices back up. It took them 25 years to get that market share back. They're looking at the global oil market and saying, we don't have 25 years to waste. 
we need to produce the oil now while there's still significant value to it. Um, and so what Saudi Arabia has done over the last year has been completely rational and appropriate market response. Now they're actually trying to sell off pieces of Aramco, uh, the national oil company, through an IPO. They're basically saying the value of Saudi Aramco is oil in the ground, and they're saying we'll sell shares of that, we'll get money today for future oil. The only rational reason to do that, there are two reasons. One, you need money today. Saudi Arabia clearly does. But two, you kind of think maybe the oil on the ground is not going to have the value in the future that other people think, so you're willing to trade shares of it today. So other kind of big changes. Peak oil. This is, uh, I forgot to put, this is Google Trends use uh, of the word searches for peak oil, web pages with peak oil. Um, the peak month for peak oil searches was August of 2005. You know, the, 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 our, our obsession with peak oil, our fear of peak oil has clearly receded. Um, we've actually moved on now to this question of peak demand. Have we hit the maximum, the highest level of demand we're ever going to be at? And I would argue that at least in the OECD, the organization of um, OECD, Thank you. The big industrialized advanced economies of the world. Um, I would argue in the OECD, yeah, we have hit peak demand. We're, we, are, we have used in the past more fossil fuels than we will in the future on an annual basis. And this is IEA World Energy Outlook from last year, and I think it shows you that. United States, European Union, they think we're going to go down considerably over the next um, 15 years or so. Uh, in terms of oil usage, definitely in terms of coal usage, uh, and, and not, will go up in terms of natural gas usage. Uh, but basically we're entering a period where this whole paradigm that we're going to use more year after year after year um, is out the window. Uh, lower for longer. Goldman Sachs came up with this phrase in July 2015, sort of described uh, where we were in terms of oil prices. Uh, Goldman Sachs obviously is still fairly influential. Price of oil fell 4.7% that day. Um, so what this shows you is what I did is I took, went back and took a look at the peak price um, from 85, 2008, 2014, three big price collapses, set that at one, and then just took a look. But as you can see, 2014, the drop didn't happen as quickly but it's sticking around longer and it's, it hasn't recovered as much 579 days later. Uh, than it did in either 85 or 2008. Um, once again, one more sort of idea of, of change. Um, Elon Musk, electric cars, EVs. Uh, this is what's been happening to the EV stock. It's growing very quickly. Um, the year 2015 saw a global threshold of 1 million electric cars on the road exceeded for the first time. It actually ended up, end of the year 2015, with 1.26 million electric cars. Okay, that's not a lot of cars in the grand scheme of things, but uh, in 2014, only half of the existing electric vehicle car stock existed that existed at the end of 2015, so it was doubling in a year. In 2005, 10 years ago, you could measure the number of electric cars in the world in the hundreds, obviously considerably more. So why does the oil and gas industry need to think more about innovation, innovating quickly, how to structure itself to be more innovative, because the energy industry is in a period of transition unlike any other, uh, both in terms of pace uh, and in terms of scale than it's seen since the late 19th century. Now, I don't know if any of you noticed, but I have not mentioned climate change once since I started speaking. It's not because I don't believe in it. It's not because I don't think it's important. It's because you don't have to even think about climate change to realize that the energy industry needs to adapt and change quickly. Uh, because it's happening all around. Now, whether people are buying electric vehicles because of concerns about climate change, whether they're buying electric vehicles because, man, do they have great acceleration, or for another reason, it doesn't really matter. It's happening, and the energy industry needs to respond to that. So, um, kind of running out of time, let me just walk through a, a real quick hypothetical. In 2014, global demand for oil was 90.6 million barrels a day. Um, of that, 10.1 million barrels, 11%, went for feedstock and chemical processes, another 1.4 million barrels, went into petrochemicals for fuel. Uh, other industrial was 4.9 million. I'll kind of bring this all together. 
Um, another 5.4 million barrels, 6%, was in air transportation. Uh, 11.7 million was sort of in this miscellaneous agricultural usage, lubricants, bitumen. So I would argue that this core oil demand um, is going to be hard to phase out. It's going to be hard to phase out away from liquid fuel for planes. It's going to be hard to phase out liquid fuel for petrochemicals, et cetera. Uh, but altogether, when you put all that together, uh, including 7.6 million barrels for something called billion, for, for buildings, I know what buildings are, I'm not quite sure exactly how we're using 7.6 million barrels uh, a day for buildings, the IEA didn't explain it, uh, but let's be conservative, let's throw the 7.6 billion into the mix in terms of core, uh, that's 41.1 million barrels a day of oil usage that's going to be hard to replace, 45% of the total oil demand. What's left? Uh, the other sectors of oil demand, I think, are much more vulnerable to change right now. The biggest is transportation minus aviation, cars, trucks, 44.1 million barrels, just under half. The balance of that is power generation, which has been going down pretty dramatically over the, over the years as we replace it with other more efficient forms of fuel. Um, so what happens in 15 years if electric vehicles grab 10% of the market and power generation continues to decline the way it's been? Um, 6.5 million barrels of oil demand disappear, assuming a static no growth. Um, if electric vehicles grab 20%, it's 11 million barrels. And just remember, this is really important, um, the price of oil is set on the margin. The last barrel that's needed is what sets the price of oil. What happens if you cut 11 million barrels of demand out of a 90 million barrel market? The price of oil is going to collapse. Um, and even, it's, it's, it's going to collapse by a lot more than 10%. If you cut away 10% of demand, the price of oil is going to collapse by a lot more than 10%. Um, and, you know, in this kind of scenario, there's going to be a reinforcing cycle where the competition for market share will intensify. More companies will, will try to drill the oil that they have left before what they have is basically stranded by market forces. The only way to survive this is to innovate and to speed up the metabolism of the industry. And so... Um, let me just wrap up, because I know we want to do questions. I got back yesterday from spending two days at the Permian Basin International Oil Show at the Hector County Coliseum in Odessa, Texas. It's an enormous, mostly outdoor show uh, where you've got rigs everywhere, you've got uh, pressure pumping units, you've got everything is just on for show out there, um, down to like safety gloves. Uh, lots of swags given away. I saw 30 koozies and I stopped counting, just tons of stuff. Um, but what was really kind of interesting was that there were, and I'm not quite sure why, but there were about three booths that are giving away fiberglass rods as sort of swag, oil field swag. And someone explained to me, I asked one person what it was for, and they, I really hope, jokingly said it was for keeping your kids in line. Somebody else said, no, this is for like, uh, for, for sheep herding. I, I'm not sure, but there were these, these rods that were being given away. And everyone, it seemed like, was walking around with rods. Um, and... It was outdoors in Odessa, it was 90 degrees, and everyone had sunglasses on. So I took a picture, and I, I just couldn't help thinking that like, everyone was walking around looking like people who were blind with canes and sunglasses, and this was the oil field show uh, in Odessa. I took this picture yesterday. This is what it looked like, people walking around with their canes, you know. Um, and so uh, I just want to suggest, thank you very much for listening. Um, I just wanted to suggest that um, there's sort of a... Uh, uh, a metaphorical issue facing the energy industry. Uh, they are walking a little blind right now into the energy transition, and that it would behoove them, uh, if they wanted to survive, to start thinking maybe a little bit more like Total is, and thinking about how do you graft some of that Silicon Valley DNA um, into your own DNA. Uh, I wrote the book, buy it, look at my website, follow me on Twitter, send me an email if you want. Thank you very much. Okay, let's take some questions. Students first. Where she has a microphone. Thank you. Uh, the Paris Agreement goes into effect on November, I think November 4th of this year. Mm -hmm. How does that affect the timetable even more for fossil fuel? Um, you know, maybe this is by dint of me being a business reporter, but I have a, a bias here, and my bias uh, 
is that um, business is driving the agreements a little bit more than the agreements are driving business. So, I mean, it puts pressure. It clearly puts some pressure on the transition. Uh, but until we figure out a substitute for liquid fuel, we're not going to transition off liquid fuel. I mean, until electric vehicles are basically a parity or very close to it, or bring something else to that value proposition. Um, so yeah, it does put pressure. And you know, you saw that agreement, well, you may have seen the agreement in Rwanda a couple last weekend about phasing out the HFCs. Um, you know, the backstory there is that the industry got on board with it and saw business opportunity. So they came out with these HFOs, I'm not sure of. Um, exactly, I can't remember exactly what that stands for. So I think the role of government and the role of the Paris Agreement is to sort of set, this is where we want to go. And then it's a question of how quickly the businesses and the technology sort of get there. Um, but there's, there's a lot of momentum. It's difficult for me to see how this momentum unwinds at this point. Next question. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gold, I, I was wondering if what's going to happen with the oil and gas industry in third world countries where there is a very important gap, technological and public policy gap, between the United States and developed countries that will transition into cleaner energies in the following years. However, other not so strong democracies might want to continue with the traditional cheaper ways of extraction. Do you anticipate our companies moving down there? So this is what I think will happen. Um, and this is a, my supposition, so take it for that. Um, the tech, clearly if you're, and, and I don't know if you were paying attention when I showed that OECD chart about how European Union, U.S. was using less fossil fuels. If you looked on the far, I guess it would be left, you know, you saw India and China using vastly more, um, especially India. Um, clearly, for the sake of their internal economic development, they want cheap fuel, right? They don't necessarily want polluting fuel. In fact, if you go to China and you go to Beijing, you realize that they have, there's a very big disincentive towards polluting fuel. They want inexpensive, reliable fuel. So the question, I think the transition begins when there's enough capital in places like the United States and the European Union, and they create alternative fuels which can compete on price with the existing coal stock and the existing uh, fossil fuels. And that's when I think you'll see that transition. So if there's a que you know, if you want to kind of take a, a positive message from this, there's so much capital and interest right now in certain parts of the world that that will technologically transfer because of market mechanisms. I mean, one of the things that I really firmly believe is that global warming is such a large intractable problem that the only genuine solution you're going to find to it is going to have a market force behind it. It will happen when the market dictates a, a switch over to a cleaner, more reliable, and less expensive fuel. That is not happening immediately, but it's, going, it's getting there. Uh, and if you look at things like wind, if you look at the solar development in, in Chile, for instance, where it's competing very, very much at parity with coal, it's starting to happen in certain places. And that's a very unexpected development from 10 years ago, I would, I would argue. Uh, thank you very much. Keep saying it. Cue the, cue the Jeopardy uh, theme song. We can uh, hear you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in the electric power space, uh, many organizations are moving towards high reliability organizational models using a lot of the same techniques you talked about. Mm -hmm. Deference to expertise, um, shared learning, um, turning near misses or even events into learning opportunities mm -hmm. rather than things that get buried in collaboration. I'm curious, do you also find that safety culture and organizational culture also is shifting within these sort of more agile um, companies, also counter to the big oil companies? Um, that's a really good question, and I'm not sure I have a great answer for that. The last time I spent much time focused on safety culture was around the Deepwater Horizon in 2010. Um, and, you know, the, the big oil companies clearly had a very elaborate safety culture. Uh, it just didn't work in this case. Um, there was, there were, and there's specific reasons for it. So I don't, I don't have a really great answer for that. I certainly hope 
that safety culture would have the same kind of learning um, and wouldn't be left behind, but I, I don't know what the answer to that is. It sounds like you probably have a better handle on it than I do, okay. So, thank you as well. Um, quick question, and this kind of goes into the safety as well, so. Okay. Um, in Silicon Valley, if you fail, for example, and you make these mistakes, uh, your app doesn't work, um, your capital goes away, um, that's very sad, but if... No one dies. No one dies. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm wondering these big environmental impacts. I actually showed a friend of mine who's not an engineer. She works in liberal arts, and she saw your fail fast. She saw that and was just like, oh, this is oil and gas again. And I was like, great. Like, I'm the bad guy again for being the chemical engineer going right. to oil. But how, how do you respond to that? Well, so, you know, I mean, clearly I didn't come out and say, oh, we just need to take the Silicon Valley model and apply it to oil and gas. Um, you know, one time out of 20, my ESPN app, for some reason, doesn't work and give me the baseball scores that I want. You know, that type of one in 20 fail is completely, uh, you know, can you imagine one in 20 fail happening on an oil well? Um, you know, there'd be financial repercussions, there'd be environmental repercussions, there'd be safety repercussions. So that clearly, there are certain things about the big oil model that need to be maintained. Safety clearly is one of them. Um, and uh, so, no, I, I, I agree. There's certainly you cannot scrap um, the whole energy model. And when you think about, but, but you know, look at renewables. Renewables are sort of a fascinating example of this. The utility model of energy distribution in the United States was based on reliability. You know, that they were going to gold plate um, the distribution, the generation, to make sure that you did not have brownouts or blackouts. And those are incredibly rare events. It was built on a model of reliability. 100 times out of 100, you flip the switch and the light goes on. Um, but at the same time, then you had this much more entrepreneurial culture coming up through the wind farm people. And at first, the utility people said, no, that, that, that was going to destroy our reliability. Um, we don't know how to handle that, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you saw these arguments going back to 1977 when there's sort of this famous Con Ed case where there's a wind, literally one windmill. I guess you'd have to call it a wind turbine, but it basically was a windmill, um, in New York City that was feeding power into the Con Ed grid. And Con Ed like, was flipping out on this reliability issue. Well, as it turned out, you can add gigawatts of wind and not have a problem with reliability. So that's sort of the issue, I think, that the energy industry needs to look at, which is how do you, don't just completely reject this entrepreneurialism and this idea because it's going to mess up your reliability and clearly the whole world needs lots of oil, et cetera, et cetera. Find ways to bring it in-house. Um, and and the, the, the electrical model, I think, is, is shows that it can be done and can be done much more easily, I think, than, than people think. Got a question over here. Yes. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, my question is about um, time scales and responsiveness of oil and gas companies, I guess, here in the U.S. to uh, price signals, mm -hmm. and so I guess my question is, um, just based on your expertise of the industry, like how quickly in the future will oil and gas companies, like how quickly will they respond to um, like high prices, low prices? I know that rig counts are today about a third of maybe what they were two years ago, and I guess my question is, if there's a big um, spike or a big drop, you know, will that be immediately mitigated by a change in production? No, not immediately, but six to 12 weeks. I mean, you know, the, this, the, 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 the U.S. energy industry um, is fairly quick at this point. They've been drilling all these wells that are called ducks, D-U-C, drilled but uncompleted, ready to come. I mean, if, if oil prices for some, if, if a major producer were to go offline, you could see a, a fairly rapid response. Um, on the way down, it took a little bit longer to sort of shut off the tap than people want, expected. That actually had more to do with capital markets and capital requirements. Um, I had debt to service. You know, yes, rationally, I should, I'm out of the money, I should cut this, but I need revenue coming in to pay my bankers. So um, the slowdown was a little slower than people expected. It took well over a year, probably close to 18 months. I think the ramp up will be quicker because you won't have those same financial issues. To, to what extent do you think uh, Europe, Europeans will start fracking? I mean, they've clearly <laughs> been against it, but it seems to me that uh, Poland might be a, 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 a... Poland geologically just turned out to be kind of a mess. Um, 
you know, so we're starting to see it a little bit in, your, in England right now. Um, the biggest problem with fracking in Europe has been that there's been a misalignment of incentives. In the United States, the landowner, by and large, has owned the mineral rights, had a huge financial incentive to let the companies come in and drill. That doesn't exist in Europe. They have not figured out a way to mitigate that. So, you know, essentially you're going to bring in a lot of truck traffic and noise and, and air emissions and, and fumes, and we're not getting any, the local population is not getting anything from it. So I think until there's some mitigating factor, either until there's some way the government figures out a way to compensate locals or there's a, a, um, an oil shock, a price shock, something which impels it, uh, I, I don't see it moving very quickly. And I, that's been the lesson, I think, of the last five, ten years. People thought, oh, Poland's going to happen, Hungary's going to happen, Europe, you know. There's apparently a great shale around Paris. That's not going to happen. I mean, it's, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So a couple of Silicon Valley characteristics that have emerged in the past couple of years in the solar industry mm -hmm. um, are um, consolidation among different companies and vertical integration. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious uh, whether you think that um, either of those characteristics could apply to shale or oil production more than they currently do, or if you also see any possibility for cross-industry consolidation like s solar companies being bought out or merging with... Vertical integration, what was the other one? Uh, consolidation. Consolidation, okay. Um, I've actually been surprised by the low level of consolidation we've seen in the shale industry. I thought we'd see a lot more of it. Um, I think probably one of the reasons you haven't seen more consolidation is th for some of the examples I gave earlier, that all of the big attempts to do that have been failures. Um, we do see a vertical integration, though. Um, EOG, which I would argue um, is probably the most successful pure shale company to have emerged out of this boom, um, they're vertically integrated in the sense that they run their own sand mines and get their own sand, you know, so they've done that kind of vertical integration into uh, services. They've got their own crews and whatnot. Uh, so we have seen some of that, and it's been successful. So it seems like uh, the fate of oil industry is going to be similar to coal industry. So is there any lesson that we can learn from it? Well, I think the first lesson is the coal industry didn't think, thought it was invulnerable, didn't think that it could happen so quickly, didn't prepare for it, uh, didn't invest in future technology. Clean, uh, clean, the idea of clean coal, I don't think the coal industry ever took particularly seriously. Um, they paid lip service to it. Uh, so I think one lesson would be to take the environmental considerations more seriously than they are right now. Uh, not to sort of hold it off and say, oh, stranded resources, you guys are a bunch of kooks. Keep it in the ground, you're a bunch of kooks. But to take at least some of those concerns seriously and to recognize that there is a cultural shift going on where people want to see carbon emissions dealt with. And that to what extent, what role you can play, whether that's going out and buying renewable uh, uh, renewable energy to bring into your mix or, or some other approach. But I would say that if, if oil wants to avoid the fate of coal, and it has some things going for it. Coal is very, was very replaceable. There are lots of alternatives to coal. You can burn natural gas. You could burn petroleum. You, know, you could have nuclear power. Plant. There are lots of different ways to replace coal. Oil is a little better protected. Very difficult to find petrochemical, uh, alternative petrochemical sources, alternative uh, transportation. But, you know, it's starting to happen. Ten years ago, um, there were, uh, you know, electric cars didn't really, weren't on the market. So take, take energy transition seriously. It happens and it builds up its own momentum and it will overtake you. Be prepared for it. Try to get ahead of it. So. Hey, got a question over there. Yes. Yeah, so um, thank you. Thank for you for helping me with OECD. I just mine for No worries. Um, I used to work there for a little while. Oh, there um, you go. So, in terms of, I guess my question is actually about um, kind of corporate structure uh -huh. um, in terms of the way, the best way for these, you know, big traditional oil companies to um, adapt some of these more nimble Silicon Valley type yeah. um, characteristics. Do you see that better being served by kind of the ExxonMobil buying the XTO and keeping it as an independent unit or changing the kind of, keeping the same vertical structure or integrated structure and trying to change the culture or a hybrid of the two? Um, I guess, what do you think that, like, in terms of actual structure of the corporation? Yeah, I'm channeling my inner McKenzie uh, consultant mm -hmm. here. Um, 
I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, the XGO model has been successful in a lot of ways. What was unsuccessful about that acquisition was they, it was a horrible bet on price. They just bought it at the wrong time. Um, the model has worked. So clearly that is one model that I think you could say has worked to a fairly good extent, keeping it separate, um, letting it run essentially independently, isolating it. Um, I'm... I'm sort of thinking this on my feet. I would think that if you really want to be more transformative and to think more about where you need to be, I think you need to more try to integrate it into uh, not just have it as sort of an interesting unit over there, but really try to bring it in to the company as a whole. So thinking on my feet, I think more of the latter than the former. I don't see any. No? All right. So do you, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, should, saw, I shouldn't have brought up electric vehicles. Uh, actually, no, because I saw some of the same dynamic with the computer industry, mainframes versus distributed. Mm -hmm. uh, drug companies may have gone through this too, and they, they try to acquire. What lessons do you see from those types of industries and, and what they've gone through in the similar Well, we've had this conversation, you and I, in the past, right? And the lesson seems to be that you know, by the time you realize you're being overtaken, it's too late to buy your way back. So, so if that holds, and, and I'm not sure, energy industry moves more slowly than the computer industry. Um, hmm. I'm not sure I have a great answer. I mean, that's the I mean, I think what I'm trying to do is point out that that's the struggle that they face. That, that's the issue they face. I'm not sure I have the exact, they should buy, they should develop, et cetera. Um, I think, though, I am, I am interested in the total model, which is to say our core competency is oil and gas, but you know what? We're going to look at this completely different model of energy production and distribution to try to understand that we're going to bring it in-house. Um, I think that kind of thinking, that kind of breaking from the mold, uh, makes a lot of sense to me right now. Well, with that, thank you very much. Join me in thanking you. Thank you for coming out. So, let me just, so next week we have Elizabeth Stein, the senior manager of New York Clean Energy Law and Policy for EDF. She's going to discuss the New York Rev. That's the revised energy vision that they're putting through. And then November 3rd, calling me in someone you may have seen here before. He's the Director of Regulatory and Public Affairs for First Solar. So join us then. Thanks.